everybody. Welcome back to the Brando and Joe podcast. For today's podcast episode, we have Jacob Ibragimov. He recently graduated from Hofstra's Master I.O. program, the one that Brandon and I are currently in. Has previous experience at Retenza Employee Retention, Estee Lauder Company, and currently works at KPMG for Change Management. Welcome, Jacob. Thanks Welcome. for joining us. Hi, Joe. Hi, Brandon. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, no, this is cool. We always like talking to alum. I know we've met at a the Houndstooth Pub, I probably for like a couple minutes. I think we talked for just like a little bit, right? Yeah, but those are a couple of good minutes, man. I, I always like speaking to folks that are, you know, in the program, uh, getting into the field. It's always fun knowing like where they see themselves and um, just understanding where they want to go and how I can help them. It's always, it's always great. It's helpful for us. I know Brandon and I were Looked like lost dogs. Not at all. <laughs> in the beginning of the master's no. program. <laughs> well, yeah, I wasn't there for that. But no, you guys, you guys are great. Um, lots of energy, lots of excitement. That's you want to say. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, we recently had on uh, Deeksha. That was an episode that came out, and it occurred to us because you worked at Retenza Employee Retention, uh, and that was like what the whole episode was about. Um, was that yeah. one of your like first? IO type of jobs. Um, cause I feel like I've the more and more I hear that name, like I see more and more people at that company. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it was my first IO related job. So before that I used to work for the MTA. Um, I worked as a, an intern or aid, an HR intern aid. And yeah, I, I, I worked there and this was before I started at Hofstra, but I knew I was like aware of principles. And so I tried to apply like the very little that I, that I knew over there, that's kind of where it started. And it just, you know, it flowed into Retenza and so on and so forth. That's awesome. Yeah. We were, cause we were talking with Deeksha recently about her work at Retenza and everything she's been doing and they're doing some great IO work there. Uh, but that is kind of a good segue into the work that you did and then heading over to Hofstra. So what was kind of that driving factor for you going and getting your master's at Hofstra? Yeah. So it's a very long story, but long story short, I helped someone get into, uh, or at least try to figure out what they wanted to do early on, like my early twenties. And they were really into IO. And the more I kind of learned from them about I O the more I fell in love with it, the field. And I said to myself, if I ever decided to go back to school, I would go back and I would pursue that. And, and I did. No, I didn't see Was your undergrad like in the business psych realm? Like, was this like any thought of going for this? No. So my first degree is in, is in media studies and, you know, basically concentrating and advertising. I did that. And that was fun, but I feel like there was more that I could do when I was in that field. And I just had these different jobs that didn't really relate to my field as well. I just like doing a lot of different things. I like throwing myself in different uh, pools to see if I could swim. And, you know, if you can, great. Keep applying, keep learning those new tricks like Michael Phelps, right? And I'm no way comparing myself to Michael Phelps, but <laughs> I think we all would like to eventually, Aim high, right? do it. Aim <laughs> high, but Keep going. <laughs> yeah. So I started there and I just, I wasn't super excited about doing media studies. That it was something that I picked when I didn't know what I was doing in college. I was just kind of figuring it out. I was very young when I started, uh, you know, going to college, I was 16. So it was kind of tricky for me, but when I figured out what I wanted, I knew that I had to go back. So I went back for psychology for my second degree in undergrad. Um, and then immediately right after that, I went to Hofstra for IO. So it's a little bit of an un unconventional path, but it's obviously it's been working out in your favor. We should actually get you uh, on part of our social media team with the media studies. <laughs> maybe know some tricks that could help us out. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. But no, that it, it is cool. And I, and I love when I get to hear with our guests, like the different paths that they take to get into either their master's program or into a career, because there's not like one 
blanket way for all of us to kind of go and create these careers for ourselves. We can do a lot of different things and try out different degrees. Um, do you think that like having those two backgrounds, like those two bachelors helped you out in the long run now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, with media studies, you know, it's that specifically that degree. It's all about really understanding the different modals, uh, or I guess the different mediums in, in this way, uh, and how they work together to kind of communicate a message, right? There's different types of media. I mean, it's, it's insane. And so, but knowing and understanding how to use each type of media for your purpose, it works, a, you know, it works really well when you know how to do that. Um, but I think in terms of, did it help me now, potentially? Is it something that I think about? <laughs> Not really. I think it, <laughs> it probably works in the background, right? It's, it's doing something. I like to think it could help out. Like, I feel like everything that you've done in the past kind of like leads to where you are now. So like, even though you may might not do in like a media centered role, going through that process and then having it lead you to like your psych and now IO psych, it kind of like, like a step by step, you're like, oh, now I'm in IO. And maybe if you didn't do media, you might have not found yourself here. Um, I, I will tell you, I will tell you that. You know, the aspect that does still help me is kind of like the sales aspect of, of media, media studies and advertising, right? Knowing what you're selling, understanding the audience and figuring out how you can get that message to the audience. That very much works in change management. If you don't know your audience, if you don't understand what your audience wants, if you don't understand what your, the value of whatever you're selling uh, is, what that value is, and if you can't marry what your audience wants and what you're selling, it doesn't go anywhere. So it still works in that, in that regard. But in terms of uh, comms, again, like I said, you know, understanding the different types of media and how they all work together, that definitely works long term as well. But, you know, for sure, everything that you do definitely adds to the whole, you know, of you. No, a hundred percent. And I, I kind of see where you're coming at with like, NIO and I guess maybe like that change management consulting center focus, working with clients, especially like in like an external consulting role, you kind of have to know what your clients wants and needs are and how to get your message across in the way you want to get it across, I guess. Like um, in one of, one of the projects I did, they're saying like, we need to present these numbers in a way with like the message we want to say and not try to put off a different message. Um, in a loosely worded way of saying it. Um, but is that kind of what the work you're doing in change management is showing like, this is what we need to do, but there's a certain way you have to say it. Yeah. I mean, I think in change, it's a lot, it's a lot of story building, right? Yeah. You're building that story. You're, you're taking these folks who are being impacted through a, a journey, a change journey, if you will. <laughs> and you got to make sure that story is compelling enough for them to travel that, that path that you're putting forward in front of them. You got to make sure that they do have the desire to travel that road that you're building for them. And if you aren't able to do that, well, then you're going to have a problem. Definitely. I, as somebody who's also working in change management, I've learned that it's not just about like creating that story because that, that is very true, but it's also like the language that you speak because every company speaks their own language and you have to make sure that you're speaking theirs and you're not speaking yours. And I think that that's like very interesting, uh, especially if you're talking about your past and working with different types of media and whatnot. I guess that really does tie in to the type of work that you have to do and the way you communicate with your clients too. And that could kind of be that full circle type of approach. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We found it. <laughs> <laughs> but that that is a good segue for us um we really we really did like we always do uh, a background look into your work and we kind of wanted to kind of get into the bulk of what this episode's about to be about um so your work at kpmg uh, when you started there how did your uh degree at hofstra kind of help you with the work that you started doing at kpmg that's a great question i think yeah, you know, there are classes that we have in in at Hofstra, specifically like kind of center around um, consulting, right? How to be a good consultant. A lot of 
a lot of, you know, what we learn is like being good at listening and understanding what you are being told and making sure that what you're being told is also something that they actually want. So aligning these two different things. Am I, am I hearing you? And are you hearing what I'm saying? And do those two things align? So Hofstra did a great job with really, with that, you know, kind of hammering in our, in our heads, like understand what the client wants, understand what, what people want. Don't assume. You might have all the theories, right? You leave grad school with all this theory, but just because you have all this theory doesn't necessarily mean you're going to apply it in a specific situation. You have to understand when certain theories make sense when and when certain theories need to kind of, you know, kind of chill out a little bit, right? You need to understand where your client is at, where the organization is at. You need to assess them. And only when you assess them can you really start to go forward with the solutioning. But that's something that Hofstra does a great job with. Uh, really hammering home, home that it's not about you telling a client what is good for them. It's understanding where they're coming from and collaborating with them to come up with a solution where they're happy and they feel empowered and you're happy because you help them get to that place of empowerment. I definitely agree. I know we had a whole bunch of projects in some of our classes that it was like, we can learn about this theory, but if you just put that like theory definition up on like a slide, you know, what does that really mean? You have to be able to convey that meaning or same thing with numbers. Like you can't just put like an average and, you know, a standard deviation and be like, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> figure it out. Theory. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. We did our number crunching. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I'm wondering at KPMG, is it, is a, is it a lot of that storytelling? Like, is there a kind of a learning curve that comes from, what we do at the school versus what you're doing now? Like how much of that storytelling did you really have to learn? To? Well, I, I think you also need to keep in mind um, when I came to, when I started with, with Hofstra, when I, when that program began, I came in with a lot of experience. So I feel like I came at some kind of advantage. So for me, grad school was about really getting that theory for others, it may have been about getting that theory and understanding, you know, kind of what you're talking about, getting ready, getting prepared to uh, have those intangibles and understanding what those intangibles are. You know, it's not just a theory. It's also about talking and, and trying to find out and being friendly and, and really, really getting at what the person wants, right? Some people may not be equipped to do that in the very beginning, and they need to learn how to do that. And Hofstra does a great job with that, right? I mean, I remember we had like uh, small groups. I don't know if you guys for internship, right? We had an internship class and we have, we have small groups. And I love that because we did a lot of that. We learned a lot about the intangibles. You know, it's not just about what you know, it's about how you're able to convey. Does that make sense? Yeah, we, we talk about that internship class a lot. We haven't taken it yet, but we had our internship director on the podcast for her to kind of explain what we do in that class and the reason for it, um, Dr. Grossman. And like, honestly, that's where we've heard a lot of value came from because as we're kind of entering the field of IO, Joe and I, Joe now knows more, more or less what he wants to go into. I'm still figuring that out a little bit, but that internship class sounds like it's a great way for you to hear different things that your classmates are doing in their work and what kind of could resonate with you. And, it, and I'm sure that's probably something you got from it too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I to this day, Team Shahani small group. I even <laughs> well, have we the shirt. Upon it I like should have worn, I should have worn that shirt. Seriously, <laughs> I'm so sorry, Doctor Shahani. I should have represented better. Um, <laughs> that group did a great job in kind of breaking down so, certain barriers. It's like, well, you know, this might be the right solution, but like, how do I bring it up? You know, how would I how do I bring it in? All right, well, let's take it back a little bit. Let's understand what's going on. And also, let's understand that we're not machines here. Uh, we're people. Those people are people. And, you know, we need to connect on a human level. And then we can start to convey what we need to. And that's what IO does, too. Like, I feel like that's the one thing that I like IO kind of helps ground us 
from time to time because you can get lost in the theory for sure. But then you also have to remember that like you are dealing with people on a day to day basis. So in order to do that, you need to recognize the other side. For sure. And like, you know what? That's actually one of the biggest reasons why I fell in love with IO in, in my early 20s. Um, I was finding out really qu- uh, really quickly when I was helping this friend study and, and, you know, figure out how to get into that world. You know, that world was all about helping people. You know, we say that IO is basically a mental health profession. You know, when it comes to change management, it absolutely is. You have these people going through, you know, it, well, it depends, right? It could be a gigantic change. You have folks who have been at a company for 40 years and you're telling them the way you did things, well, that's wrong now. I'm sorry. That's, that's so much to just take in, right? You need to learn a new technology. Well, all right, am I going to lose my job because I, I, you know, I don't know how to do this thing? That's, that's scary. That is absolutely scary. And, you know, as we learn in grad school, it's a a huge reason as to why lots of change initiatives fail because folks feel scared and organizations might not even be ready. And you have all this money just gone. Right. And we see also sometimes organizations kind of, you know, revert back to what they were doing beforehand Mm -hmm. because, well, it's just easier. Let's just drop what we were doing. Let's just kind of go back. It's it's uh, it's really unfortunate. Do they? give you any uh, tips or advice when dealing with the straw people or like when you have to go up to someone and be like, this is what we're doing, like this new thing. Um, and they're like, oh, we don't want to do that. And then it's like, becomes like an issue. Uh, do they help you kind of talk with the people that way instead of just like the slide deck consulting aspect of it? Well, you know, we actually learned this in grad school as well. You're going to have that come up time and time again. For sure. You're going to have people that are just absolutely used to this one way of, of doing things. And also think about this. You have leaders, right? They're leaders for a reason. They got to that point because they're good at what they do. And now you're telling them that the thing that got them to where they're at, that's wrong now. So of course, you're going to get pushback from them. What do you mean? I'm, I'm C-suite. What are you talking about? I got to change? No, this is, this is how I got here. And this is how I bring money to the company. And so in our program, we learn really quickly not to fight fire with fire because that doesn't do anything. It's just more fire. It's try to understand where these people are coming from, right? You know, let's understand why you were successful with this way of working for all these years. Let's try to understand that maybe this new way of working can actually help amplify the way you used to work. Maybe it can help you. Maybe you're closing... 10 deals a month. Now you'll close 15 deals a month. Isn't that, isn't that great? Doesn't that excite you? You need to understand why they feel the way that they do. It's only when you understand why they feel the way that they do, that you can actually start talking about how you can help them feel even better. That's kind of where I get, where I enjoy change management because you're taking something that it might work and you're even, but you're making it better. But on top of that, there are probably reasons for the change uh, that can either go unstated or stated. And I do think that that's one of the things that comes with change management. It's like walking that fine line and you can't just apply every solution to every problem because every person has their own reason for why this change is happening. And so when you go into a company for you specifically, Jacob, like and you're doing what you need to do. Is that intake process, like how long does that usually take for you? Like when you're trying to like get your lay of the land and figure out what kind of route you're going to take? Well, you know, my experience at KPMG has been an interesting one because they brought me in specifically for one project. And I've been on that project since the very beginning. I haven't (laughs) gotten to a place where I felt that yet, you know, you know, getting the lay of the land. That being said, this is a pretty big project. And uh, there are different types of things that we're implementing. You know, I can't talk too much about it. Yeah. You know, we are implementing, uh, you know, we are implementing something right now and we've introduced the tech and now we need to introduce the the different uh, new different types of like functionalities of this tech. Mm-hmm. And you're still trying to get the lay of the land, right? You can't just go in and be like, hey, by the way, now that, that you know, you know about this new thing and you accepted it, check out all this other cool stuff. Oh my God, you can't do that. You need to understand, you know, well, now that you have this thing and you've played around it, how can you make it better? 
again, it's, it's a, it's collaborating. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it is exciting. I wanted to know though, cause I know your, your previous role at Estee Lauder was purely consulting or just consultant, if that's correct. <laughs> cause now I know you do change management. Is there like, um, does it help you prepare for what your role is right now? Cause I know we talked about in the beginning a lot that I owe you could do so many different things. And then you feel like you center it down into consulting, but consulting is still like a pretty large field. Um, mm-hmm. Were they similar at all? Or is it kind of like two totally separate positions? So we're talking about Estee Lauder, my role at Estee Lauder and KPMG. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we were doing change management and, and Estee Lauder as well. That was a little oh, bit okay. of a different experience because again, I can't really talk too much about, yeah. that experience but um it had to do with you know cultures right we were doing something we were introducing something in uh a different part of the world uh, you know in, in an asian country and or not even introducing something it was something that was going to be basically introduced within the company of Estee Lauder but it also had to do, do with you know working with folks in an Asian country and, and understanding that, well, okay, we're working with them. We need to understand how to work together. And we learn in grad school pretty quickly that, well, cultures play a huge role, right? You can't just, the way you speak, the way you collaborate with folks in a Western country, that's not going to be true in an Asian country. You know, we learned about power distance, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe you guys could give us a quick run in power distance, right? What is power distance, Joe? I've never heard that term in my life. I know it because of uh, my business. I don't, by the way, I don't need to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> it, we, but it's fair because we didn't learn about it yet. I don't, maybe we'll learn about it this year, but I learned about it in undergrad. But power distance right. is basically like when you think of the person who's in management and then everybody below them, like if there's a large power distance, then there's a huge gap between those two. And then if there's like a small power distance, the people who are below have a lot more input, a lot more say, and it's, it's like a completely different culture and feel than in the, in those two realms. And yeah. Jacob, you could tell me if I'm right. I learned that like four years ago. No, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, good <to> me. <laughs> so for example, if a leader, you know, tells you to do something in the, in a Western culture, we usually have the option or it's not really an option, but it's, it's kind of like known. You can ask why. Why are we going with this? Can you help me understand? In another country, in an Asian country, perhaps, you, you, what you usually see, and I don't want to generalize it, but what you usually see is like, okay, cool, we're doing that then. And that's that. Mm-hmm. It's more acceptance because you know the way leaders are seen might be different from, you know, from Western culture to, to an Asian culture. So um, that had to do a lot with that when I was working for Estee Lauder. Uh, learning how to work with them, learning how to communicate. Um, so that was also like a really interesting, I actually loved that. For me, it was really fun. And I also got to learn a lot about, you know, a different culture. That was great. If, correct me if I'm wrong, Jacob, but I want to say that like, that's a big part of the Hofstede dimensions. Yep. Or, Hofstede. So, yeah. Hofstede. Yep. Yeah. That's what it was. Cause I, we, I learned that in a global management class and so that was kind of where we got to talk about culture and that was kind of where the ball started rolling for me personally and kind of actually introduced me to io so it was, it was actually really cool to kind of hear what someone a call back brandon <laughs> <laughs> i love that yeah. i love that we we so, we got to the crux of why you're here right now <laughs> great. it was definitely one of them so it, it's it's interesting though right because i'm sure we all like as we get going, we kind of think back to that point where we wanted to go into the to a new field or we wanted to try something. Um, and I kind of wanted to add a point to that as well, where it's sometimes you're scared, sometimes you're not, but we're kind of going into this field with open arms now. Um, Joe and I are anyways, uh, and we're not letting things kind of dictate. We're kind of going with the flow and learning. So it's kind of one of those things where you can grow and change and learn and not, it's all fluid, especially when it comes to IO because there's just so many opportunities out there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's so diverse, right? The, this world of IO, you can, you can do anything you want and get the training, right? And part of training, that's leadership development, succession planning, 
performance management, change, HR. Yeah, it's it's so wide. And so what's beautiful about that is understanding, well, maybe the job market isn't that great. We've got a lot of options. We have a lot of options. And you got to love that. But it's yeah, also being able to be comfortable with understanding that maybe, and this is something that I was going to talk about a little bit later. You know, you might not start like right out of the gate when you graduate, you might not start at a place that y- you thought you'd be starting in. And that's okay. Your journey is not one where it's the first job you get is going to be your, that job forever. Your journey is that of chapters, right? And learning as much as you can in each chapter to get to the final destination of where you'd like to be. And even that final destination might not be the final destination. You might have a sequel, right? So understanding that the way where you start isn't generally going to be where you end up. When you have that mindset, I think you're able to be more present at a company that you're working for and you're able to actually, and it's fair for them too, right? You, you don't want to work at a company and work there because you're like, all right, this is the launch pad to my next career. And you want to be present and you, need, you want to understand that, okay, I'm going to do everything that I can for them. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring my best for them. And um, I'm going to learn from them and whatever that leads to great, but I'm going to be present for them because in the back of your mind, you understand this isn't the final. This isn't the final place. There's more. No, you're definitely right. Sometimes it can be a hard pill to swallow. I know in today's culture, it's, you know, get my master's degree and I'm going to get this great job and I'm going to be making money and, you know, successful. And it's, it it can be a learning experience where you kind of have to get that, that first job under your belt and like learn how the company and organizations actually work, even though you want to just, you know, get right into the thick of it and just start out your life. And some folks do, right? Some folks, they get that job right out of grad school and it's amazing. It's great. And it, it's great income. And sometimes it doesn't work out that way, right? It's a job that maybe you didn't, you didn't, you didn't really want, but it was the one that was around, right? But it's an opportunity. Was it an opportunity for to perhaps bring in those theories that you learned and maybe help expand, you know, leadership's mind? of how things can work. Sometimes these organizations that you work in, they're not there, you know, and when I mean there, I mean, they are, what got them there was being great, but IO shows that there are ways to be better, especially for people. So it's your responsibility to really show that and maybe be a flame where there potentially might not be any. Yeah, everything everything happens for a reason too. Like, it, if certain circumstances played out different differently in my life, I wouldn't even be at Hofstra getting my master's in I/O. I'd probably be in a completely different field. So it really all can change, and uh, that kind of does. It, you might have even answered the question, but we still want to give you an opportunity to add to it. Um, we always end our episodes off asking our guests what advice they have for incoming I/O students. Um, and we would love to hear Jacob, like if there's anything you'd like to add to yeah, what you already brilliantly said sure. or <laughs> anything that you have. Yeah. I'm going to say right now, you know, emphasize practical experience, you know, seek internships, contract work, volunteer opportunities that allow you to apply theoretical knowledge to real world scenarios, right? These experiences are going to help you understand the complexities that IO can bring and you can help adapt these these IO principles to different organizational settings. I mean, you you need to like really look for those experiences. Um, and again, back to what I was saying, you know, try to be agile in your approach. You need to understand and acknowledge that not all organizations follow that standardized, you know, for example, for me, change management methodologies. They don't. And so you need to be able to like be flexible, adaptable in implementing these IO concepts, tailor them to those unique needs. And, you know, the culture of each organization, we spoke about culture, really important. And Brandon, you spoke about this. It's not about just assuming that one size fits all. It's not the way it works. And so you need to utilize and demonstrate the benefits and effectiveness of everything that you learn, these IO practices to stakeholders and leadership. I'd also say, you know, advocate for collaboration. So you, have, you need to act like as a, as a collaborator. 
Um, and again, I'm, I'm talking from a world of change management, but in general, you, know, you need to be a change agent for and within your organizations. You got to understand that successful change management, again, talking from my experience, requires more of like support and buying from key stakeholders. But this is also true in IO generally. You want to apply IO principles, you need support, you need buying from these key stakeholders. So communication is super important. And I cannot, you know, state that enough. Communication is super important and understanding who your stakeholders are, are super important. You don't understand them. You got nothing. And I would also say, you know, focus on, you know, your, your skills just in general on communication and, you know, persuasion skills. You have to persuade. You're going to have, you're going to have people that are just not ready to hear what you want to say. And you need to understand where they're coming from to persuade. You need to understand, but also I'm just going to add my final thing. Um, you know, really seek out opportunities to get certifications right out of grad school. I, well, right out of grad school and right out of my, my contract work with Estee Lauder, I decided I was going to go and get a certification for change management. So I opted into ProSize ad car methodology, and that really helped me really kind of bolster my knowledge and change. Look for those certifications. Don't be afraid of certifications. Take advantage. I mean, really get yourself, you know, to a place where you feel like you have the skill for your role currently or the next role. So, you know, take yourself seriously and take out every opportunity. Um, I think seriously too. No. It's great advice. I know on a previous episode, we talked about certifications um, and finding a right certification for the skills you need can boost you up so much, um, especially in the tech world and the programming world. Uh, just those couple extra skills could really help you out. But I want to center on the first thing you talked about, about practical experience. Um, I know we talk about that a lot too, and how important it is that whatever you learn in school is always helpful, but every organization and every team on every organization always does things a little bit differently. Um, so getting that experience and finding out how different places apply different theories and aspects, uh, it's super helpful because then when you apply for that first job or that second job, you have all those tools under your belt and you'd be like, well, I tried it this way and I tried it this way and I tried it this way. Uh, this is what worked best for us. Um, and, you know, you kind of just looked up on in like a new light, you know, like, oh, this person has so many tools under their belt. I, I couldn't have said it better myself, Joe. Jacob, we want to thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. It was great getting to talk to you about your path and the different work you've done at Estee Lauder and KPMG. So thank you, Jacob, for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, we'll definitely see you soon. That was a great episode with Jacob. Um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but that was our first time discussing change management that in depth. Yeah, not that I could remember. Um, I think it is the first time. I always like talking about consulting because, I mean, we talked about it on the episode too. It's such a broad term. I feel like that there's so much you could do in consulting. So when we kind of get into like the nitty gritty of it and like talk about like the specific things you do in consulting, it's always so interesting, especially for students out there that want to get into it. Um, so much you can do in that field. Yeah, and as somebody who's working in consulting, I would say that it is a good launch pad for your career because you do get exposed to a lot of different things that you can do in the workforce. So like I know for me, for example, I've gotten experience doing things that I probably wouldn't have tried uh, just because I've been in consulting, but now I can say it's something I do when I go and I apply to jobs in the future. Yeah. It's just, it's another tool under your belt. It's another thing that you know how to do. Oh yeah. But thank you everybody for listening. Uh, we hope you guys like this episode and uh, please come back next week. <laughs> Listen to the next one. <laughs> Yeah, and connect with Jacob because he's got a lot of information and he loves to help out students. So make sure you guys connect with him. Yeah, especially KPMG is a big company. So utilize that. Oh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. See you.